we will anyway moving on to the main part of the show the main part of the show we want to speak about joey diaz joey diaz um decided to get on his podcast and talk about his experience going to the comedy mothership meeting joe rogan and just generally his overall vibe and i think most of you have already seen my previous stream where i mentioned it was quite sad how clearly the relationship between you know joe rogan and joey diaz isn't what it once was they're no longer as close friends as they once were before you can clearly see it with how joe was acting with joey and also the fact that he kind of rushed him off the podcast because he had to go and have dinner at 4 p.m which is absolutely crazy but still joey's in good spirits the book's about to come out soon tremendous i've actually got it pre-ordered if you haven't got it pre-ordered already please do when's it gonna come out actually i got it pre-ordered already here on my amazon joey diaz's book uh tremendous is due to come out i think if i'm not mistaken somewhere in may yeah second of may joey diaz's um autobiography called tremendous the life of the comedy savage is due to come out very very soon so check it out if you haven't already that's the cover what it looks like it looks pretty cool doesn't it tremendous i've got that on pre-order already so check it out if you haven't already but let's see what joey diaz had to say post rogan post austin post mothership let's see what his vibe is it came out it, it was tremendous the, the the sound is great the fucking the stage was great but the most important thing about it listen they just got there uh they're still high off the you know that they, they're high these people that are working there are high like they're fucking not high on weed or high on drugs but it's a high to work in there They've been telling me who's been going in there the last two weeks. It's like fucking endless who goes in there from Bill Burr to Dean Delray to fucking Roseanne Bard. I mean, it's just the people, Dave Chappelle, some fucking people from Sports World were down there last week just to watch a comedy show, somebody from Memphis or something. It's, it's, uh, he did. Well, Zach AZ, I heard what you said last night about Joe being different, but I felt the love throughout the podcast. Yeah, no, the love is still there, clearly. The love is still there. But I think what I said has been proved somewhat right or correct. I think Joe didn't realize until he opened the comedy store how important the comedy club was to him. Like he didn't really, I don't think he realized it before he actually opened it. I think now that he's opened it, I feel like he's got another passion in his life that probably supersedes the podcast. I think for the longest time, the podcast was his was his life that consumed everything about him but clearly having his own comedy club being able to perform when he wants having it be a whole new group of people that he's kind of ushering in and building up and platform and creating a whole community and a scene out there and the, the possibilities of people filming their specials there and it growing and building whatever it may be those those things are probably the only things that are really letting him get up in the morning and if you think about it joe rogan's got so much money that i'm pretty sure he's probably found it hard to have any motivation with certain things he's probably going through the motion his podcast a few times people complain about the guests a few times he's a bit stuck in his ways now but the comedy club is a definite avenue for him to kind of you know have a new lease of life so it's no surprise that he's gone balls deep in it and obviously since he's moved to texas also his relationships before have kind of fallen by the wayside so even though the love is still there with Joey, I feel like personally, just watching from the outside in, they're on they're in two different places in their life. Joey Diaz is clearly taking a step back from comedy. Even at the thing at the end of this podcast, he even says he's not going to fly anymore. So which basically is code for don't expect him to be out on the road touring. That's kind of over, and he's just living the life that he's living now. He's got a decent patron going. The book's coming out. He's doing flipping you know comedy shows at you know in these local clubs where he lives now in new jersey so it's a complete opposite of what joe's on joe's right in the thick of it he's in the middle of it he's committed to the comedy scene he's filming you know he's got his own club and shit like he's committed to that lifestyle completely so they're in completely different places that's why i felt the love is there but they're in two different places in life for sure something really good for the comics he invested in comedy he didn't invest in himself. He's got three hundred thousand million dollars. What do you give a fuck about? He did. He made an investment for comics. For all you fucking haters out there, for you people who know somebody who hates him, COVID, whatever the fuck, guys, it's all bullshit. You know, and that's 
you know, when he went to El Nido, when I took him to El Nido, he wrote a report about El Nido. He wrote like a, he put a picture up, and I'll never forget this thing he wrote. He goes, I'm paying attention to the, uh, to all the little things that they do at El Nido. You know, they do little things. You could see it. It's just, it's amazing when you go to El Nido sometimes because you, what they do with food is fucking tremendous, and it's all to the T, you know, it's all fresh. And so he wrote something about that. And I didn't look at it from that perspective, but that's a perspective he looks at things from. He looks at like, when he looked at that comedy club, he was like, I don't want it to just be a comedy club. I want it to be the best fucking, there's an elevator in that motherfucker. I was taking an elevator. I'm not walking up all those fucking stairs. I just did PRP in it, but it's great to see, you know, the last 10 years, guys, listen, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm a fucking, I'm a criminal. When I walk into a theater and the people are like, oh, you know, Al Capone performed here 18 years ago and look at this piece of art. It's all great. I just came to make these motherfuckers laugh and to pick up a check. I didn't come here to look at fucking art. I really didn't. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm a fucking animal. I really don't care. What the fuck? Just get me to the stage. Let me loose. Let me go make them laugh. Let's wrap this motherfucker up, get a check, and get the fuck out of there. When I went to Rogan's, I was paying attention to all the small details. He did so many. There's a bar downstairs called Mitzi's. That's beautiful. Just for the fucking comics. You know, just for the comics to go down there and not feel pressured with other people, blah, 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 blah. He did all those little things, you know. He's very, very fucking serious when it comes to that green room. People don't understand what a green room is. And this again proves that why I said is also true that the day-to-day -day managing of that club Joe's doing it I said oh he's gonna go and have hire somebody nah he's definitely doing it he's working alongside whoever he's got in on board Adam Eager and some other people I'm sure that working behind the scenes but Joe is definitely hands-on for sure for sure which again explains why he's distancing himself from all the LA guys and girls and stuff who are trying to get on the pod or get comedy slots over there and palming off that Amiga. He's legitimately, legitimately on point. He took it to the point where you can't get in there unless you got a fucking code. There's no just walking in. You're not going to walk in. And he made it clear, like agents and this and that. I don't want you up here. I don't want you up here commiserating, taking energy from these fucking people. Stay outside. As it should be. I don't understand why, I guess because comedy clubs are usually in like bars and pubs and shit, but I don't understand why comedy, why it would be okay for randoms to walk into comedians' green rooms anyway. You're preparing to go on a stage and tell rehearsed jokes, right? You probably need to concentrate. You probably need some alone time to kind of figure out your set, which order of things going to go in, remembering bits and stuff. The last thing you need is some random to pop in and start flipping chewing your ear off about the game or asking you about Rogan or wanting a picture. The fact that comedy clubs allowed randoms to just walk in is a bad look on those clubs anyway, to be fair. That should never happen. Go to the bar. If you're not performing, and that's what a green room is. I love doing the Sony Theater. I love it. I love it. I hope to go back next year. I, I fucking love the place. The only thing I'm going to change is what was going on in my green room. When I get down, I don't want to see anybody down there from now on. I don't want to see anybody down there. This ain't no fucking party. This ain't Rick James down there giving out quaaludes. It's just people getting ready for a comedy show. And people want to go down there and mess with them thinking that that's what I don't want to see nobody. I don't want to see nobody. I, you're here. You're here. Take a seat. Get a cocktail and relax. I don't need to see you before the show. These people that come down, we want to wish you luck. Get the fuck out of here. I've done this 10 million fucking times. I don't want to know luck. Exactly. Sit in your seat and I'll see you afterward. We'll jump up and down. But it's funny, though. It's a completely different community or different sort of vibe within like the maybe it's the same everywhere within like DJ world. For some reason, people literally want to be in the green room that's what they want they want to be in the vip area but having been in various green rooms of their various clubs especially here in london they're not as good as you think they are they basically get up to exactly what they think you think they're getting up to they're usually in there having drinks and doing drugs without going into toilets right they're just doing it out in the open they're cutting up lines at the table they're passing around pills and shit that's all they're doing in there and if you're there to party in a club i'd rather be on a dance floor partying and dancing if you're there to listen to a or watch a comedy show, I'd rather be in the audience, catching a vibe, drinking, chilling out, laughing and shit, actually there 
then hanging out in the green room and trying to look cool and shit. That's not really what I'm there for. But some people have a hang up on it. And especially in the DJ world, it's kind of seen as a kind of, um, as a mark that you're down if you're able to kind of get in those spaces and people can see you and stuff. It's a bit strange. I don't really understand the need for it, to be honest. That's peace of mind, guys. That little green room is, so, and I realized it this week, what, when I was doing the Sony theater, I would get there and I'd be aggravated. I'd be fucking aggravated. Why would I? I'm going to make people laugh. What do I want to get fucking aggravated for? So that's it. I'm banning fucking, that's it. That's the way they do it. When I was doing the improvs with Lee and all this shit, it was just me and Lee in a room. Maybe the other comedian just talking. All of a sudden, since I moved to Jersey, everybody wants to go to the green room. No. <laughs> and I realized how important it was. I'm going to tell you what Rogan did. Not only did he hold the green room sacred, he put a chair by both stages. Because you have so much going on before you go on stage. And they'll tell you the light's on. The light means you need to walk up to the stage. When you walk up the stairs to the fucking stage... You know, the people go, okay, uh, you need anything? You're like, no, I got my water. When you sit there those last three minutes before you go up, that's your world. Everything else is background music. That's your last three minutes of alone time, of time that you could focus on what you want to say, what you want to do. You get over your nervousness. You smoke that last cigarette. You do whatever the fuck you do as a superstitious, and you go up on stage. But even that, and it's not a $2 million chair. It's a simple chair just a fucking table chair that's it that's all you need and he's got a pad there and a piece of paper there's cigarettes there's weed there's everything there in case you need it a little a little table with some lines on it some pills whatever you need jesus christ but like this is probably why that club is so good because essentially rogan's got unlimited funds to do exactly what he wants anything that he would would have wished for in a club he can basically do so it's probably hard to replicate. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Bergheim. Bergheim kind of gets away with being the best club in the world because they're in the most accommodating city in the world when it comes to nightclubs. Like Berlin has this grant that they give to local nightclubs to basically um, give them um, an excuse. No, they, yeah, they give them a grant that allows them to improve on their flipping sound insulation so that they don't get complaints from neighbours. Whereas in my, in, in my country here in the UK, if a club has a fight, too many fights, they lose their flipping alcohol license, which basically renders the club mute because if your club can't sell beer or booze, then what's the point of being open? But in a place like Berlin, they, they basically give them money to improve the flipping facilities and whatnot of the flipping nightclub. So if you're, if you're a person out there who has a club you know, in America and you want to basically you know, take some inspiration from what Rogan's doing, it's pretty impossible and hard to do so because he's only doing what he's doing because he's got more money than God. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he's got a lot of money like to basically do whatever he wants and he's clearly doing it and the comedians, look at his eyes, they're flipping over the moon a bit. You get a chair next to a stage, they got waters, they've got a separate bar, the green room has a code on it that not everybody can come in the security, the take away people's phones. They love it. He's prepared. That does something to you. You know, I told people for years, I, I did a thousand fucking movies. These movies were on last week. A couple of you guys reached out to me, the Dick Van Dyke movies. I did two Lifetime movies with Dick Van Dyke. I thought I did one. I did two of them. And I'll never forget this. They didn't pay me scale. Was I angry? Not at all. That's what the job paid. They're a company. This is what they do. But the thing that made me happy about them was when you walked into the, into the fucking dressing room, there was a basket. There was a basket. Whatever. A bottle of wine, a t-shirt, a box of crackers, some fucking, you know, uh, Vermont's favorite cheese. Tastes like shit. Yeah, it's the same shit. But just a thought. Just a thought. It makes you feel so much better. It makes you feel, okay, I'm appreciated. I'll work that extra 10 minutes. I'll do this. I'll jump off a cliff for the shot because they appreciated me. You know how many times I walked into a, a comedy room or something? They don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. Listen, neither do I. I'm there to pick up a check. I'm not there to fucking analyze your fucking hospitality. But I make a mental note of it. Again, 
You- there we go. That's another reason why the bad friends decided to cancel that show in Norfolk. Pick up a check. If they don't sell tickets, these cunts don't give a fuck about their fans. You have to. You're making them a lot of money. You're making money with them. And there's some people who don't give a fuck. You go up to Nebraska, you go to the Funny Bone in, in uh, Nebraska. Yeah, I agree, Shades, Carl. I would love to see Joey on. Actually, that last appearance he did on your mom's house might have been one of the best. Might have been one of the best fucking your mom's house episodes in recent years, you know. That and maybe Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon was really good guest on your mom's house also. Your mom's house has gone to, that's another podcast that's gone to shit, man. It's been quite sad to see. Actually, is it is it bad to say this? But with Tom Segura getting in crazy good shape and Christina P unfortunately going the other way and getting a bit bigger, does this mean there's trouble in paradise? Is it one of those things where like, when a couple, when one person starts to get in shape and start looking after themselves, wearing designer clothes and stuff, that maybe, you know, there could be a possibility of Tom fulfilling that fantasy and getting a second wife. It's looking kind of crazy, man. Like I saw a picture of Christina P. I was like, fuck, man. She looks a lot bigger than she's ever looked personally. Again, maybe it's just Texas. They live over there now. They're eating good. The kids are a bit grown up now, so they can maybe go out more often. Who knows? But with Tom going the other way and getting into fucking men's health fitness flipping shape and Christina going that way, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be spooky for them too. And uh, whatever her names, I can't think of a name now. She treats you like a king. I can tell you there's eight comedy club owners that treat you like a king. Then there's 35 of them that you don't even see for the weekend. You know, you can't even come down a Thursday night and shake my hand. There's all those little things. Rogan lives at that club. He lives at that club. He lives at that club. He's there to welcome people. You know, the fucking hotel he puts the comics in. It's tremendous. You don't have to hear people yell. What's Uche saying? Uh, no, Tom. Uche saying, no, Tom is just embarrassed. He's fat as publicly. He's fat as publicly and needed to prove a point. Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Fat, fat shaming works, trust me. I've got some comments on my fucking picture uploaded in my fucking community post. <laughs> Fat shaming, not fat shaming only works for guys. I feel like I don't think women respond the same way to fat shaming. Um, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not, I'm calling, I'm calling it something else. And Space Guy said, um, it's called menopause. Yeah, true, good point. Maybe in that too. But yeah, fat shaming definitely works. So get in those comments, call me your fat shit. I dare you. And I'm gonna get into the best shape I've ever been in my entire life. Just do you watch you fucking haters. All right, you, you, you homeless cats, you, whatever nincompoops. Telling <laughs> in the middle of the night because everybody's trying to save ten bucks, but by saving those ten bucks, you turn that guy off. He's not going to come back. You know that's the most important thing is feeling appreciated. That's all I've ever wanted to feel. That's it. I don't want you to kiss my ass. I don't want you to feed me grapes. I don't want you to lick my balls. I don't want you to do nothing. I just want to feel like you were happy that I was there. I mean, for me, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to go there and take your money anyway. I like how comedians speak out of both sides of the mouth. I want to feel appreciated. I don't want you to suck my balls or lick my toenails, but I want to feel appreciated. I don't give a fuck. Actually, I'm just going to take your money. Make your mind up, mate. Make your fucking mind up. But... It just gives you, you know what? Next time I'll come here, I'm going to fucking write more. I'm going to be a lot better for these people because the club is great. And that's what makes a big difference in comedy, man. It's not the money they pay you. I can, If I did this for money, guys, you're crazy. I did this to be funny all those years. And through the years, you meet different people. You talk with different people and you see what works and what doesn't work for you. I got to tell you something. Fucking Rogan did it with this one. He really fucking did. And Austin, as far as Austin as a city, I didn't recognize it. I remembered a few spots. It's growing. They really, listen, man, growth is a beautiful thing to see. Some people don't want to see growth. Some people knows what, what comes with growth, you know. Around the corner from where I was staying. There- Do you guys buy into this? I'm having a hard time believing. I don't know. There's something I just I don't buy. Again, I'm not from America. I've never been to fucking Texas. I've never been to Austin, so I don't know. But I'm having a hard time believing all of these middle-aged men have somehow 
revived Austin because Joe Rogan opened a fucking comedy club and some dirty comedians go there and do Kill Tony and open mics and stuff and whatnot. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure comedy clubs can be a driver, but is it that much of a driver of business and people migrating over to fucking Austin and shit? Is that really going to be happening? Or are they kind of gassing it? Because if you're a young comedian and you're wanting to make moves and shit, should you be going to Austin really? The fact that it's been over flipping, it's been kind of um, inundated with all these fucking middle-aged older dudes from LA moving over there. Maybe you should avoid Austin because you're not going to get any play because all the big wigs are down there. You should probably go somewhere else. I don't know if I buy this narrative. It seems a little bit too convenient. What we're saying here, they're not, the necessity they haven't in uh, already did. I doubt it, says Jesse J. But you said made Trump made it so afford to write off some more ten thousand state income tax and federal taxes. That's why they all live in Austin. Okay, cool. For state no state income tax. Okay, that makes sense. Austin was its own special place way before they came. Says Coiler. I'm, I've been to Austin. I didn't think Austin was all that. It's a college town, home of South by Southwest. Yep, that makes sense. Um, I know of that place. Austin is equals info was AZ. Austin was already a burgeoning, up and coming city for years, attracting many young people. Okay, cool. Yeah, but it, okay, that makes sense, Yoshi. Because like, yeah, that, that makes more sense to me. Because the way they're trying to sell it is that Rogan and the comedy clubs is the reason why Austin is popping up again. I, t I just don't think that's true. And I'm also not too sure how many young people are legitimately going to be following guys in their 30s 40s 50s 60s over to a place because they're making it cool that's not how it works usually hipsters and young kids and gen z kids and millennials and stuff aren't i don't know i don't think they're that impressed by what people in their 50s and 60s are doing maybe i'm mistaken who knows they're building the biggest building in texas it's going to be a high rise like you're not gonna you know you can't see the state capital from everywhere now they've built so much in the last two years, I mean, they've done, you know, and it's going to be the capital for comedy. I I am convinced after what I saw this week. Yeah, Crashes, Nashville is, is very similar to Austin, just a little better music. But Nashville is where they have country music, right? Nashville is the home of country music. And Austin is just, you say general music, I would assume. Or am I mistaken there? It's the capital for comedy. If you're a young comic and you want to learn the business from A to Z, I'm not talking to move down there to hang out with Joe Rogan. I'm talking about the cat. They got the key, creek in the cave. They've got helium coming. They've got Cap City. Who else? The Vulcan. The Sunset Strip Comedy Room. And a thousand other other places that do comedy. If you're serious, really serious about comedy, you're just like, oh, you know, I, I, I get it. But if you're serious about your trade and about your art and you really want to improve and really want to see it from the inside out, that's the fucking town to do it. Maybe he's got a point, but I still think maybe if you're like five years in, you should probably go to Austin if you need that little bit of a push. Um, and it's good to see people, uh, you know, I think in general, when you're in the arts or you're in entertainment or these kind of fields where there's no real direct path to success or greatness. You kind of have to kind of make your own way. It's important to be around people who are better than you on either scale, right? who, who are like, you know, maybe some people are on your same level, who are a bit be worse than you, who are a bit better than you, or really, really high up to kind of get an idea of where you stand and to kind of be inspired and whatnot. That's important. But I still think if you're a new comic, if you're like two, three years in, you should have, you should spend no time in Austin because you're not going to get any time on stage, right? at any kind of meaningful club, really, you'd imagine, because all the big hitters are down there. You should probably be going to all the places they've left. If anything, you should probably be moving to New York, moving to LA. Like all these places that these guys left, you should probably go and move to because there's probably more chance of you getting up on the comedy, at the comedy store now because all of these guys are in Austin. That's what I would do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But maybe if you're five years plus in, it makes more sense to go there, but I don't think everyone should go there, really and truly. It seems a bit like odd advice, but you know, he's a professional comic. He's the one that's been in the scene for the longest. He's passed and stuff at all these good places. So maybe he, maybe and quite possibly, he does.